Hi, Ross Atkins. Welcome to today's World Have Your Say. Well, the Arab uprisings continue to provide the world's biggest talking points, and there are so many different issues and questions you're raising online that rather than focus on one, we've invited a panel of experts onto the program to respond to as many of your comments and questions as we can. So we have Egypt's most famous blogger, Sand Monkey, also Mona El Tahawi, an Arab analyst and prolific tweeter. We've also got David Ignatius from the Washington Post and former British diplomat in Syria, Paul. White way. If you've got questions for any of them, go to facebook.com slash world have your say. And if you're tweeting, use the hashtag WHYS. We've got lots to talk about, so let's get the program underway. Well, if you want to speak live to our guests, you can call us now on country code 44 2070 83 72 72. And we'll start getting answers to your many questions in a couple of minutes' time. Before that, though, let's get the latest from the BBC newsroom. The French and German leaders have called for a quick solution to the Greek debt crisis. This comes as the Greek Prime Minister, George Papandreou, has reshuffled his cabinet in the hope of winning parliamentary approval for further austerity measures. There are renewed protests across Syria against President Assad. This demonstration in the eastern town of Abu Kamal is among those that have taken place following Friday players. A number of policemen are reported to have been shot and wounded in Damascus. And unconfirmed reports say at least eight demonstrators have been shot dead. Seoul has rejected North Korea's demand to return nine people who defected by boat into the south on Saturday. North Korea has warned that relations could worsen if boat people are not returned. To China next, when day, where days of torrential rain have forced the evacuation of hundreds of thousands of people in the centre and the south of the country. The areas affected had previously been drought-stricken and the government says the floods are the worst since 1955. And NATO warplanes have carried out fresh daytime attacks on targets in the Libyan capital, Tripoli. Loud blasts were heard across the city shortly after the NATO planes flew over. Libya complained that an earlier overnight raid hit a public security building, killing a number of people and destroying criminal records. <laughs> Let me introduce you to three of our guests. Paul Whiteway is a former British diplomat in Syria. He joins us live in London. Hi, Paul. Thanks for your time. Hello. Uh, we've got Mona El Tahawi, a prolific tweeter and an Arab affairs analyst, live with us from Los Angeles. Mona, good to have you with us. Hi. And we have David Ignatius, associate editor of the Washington Post, who is in Washington, D.C. David, thanks for joining us on World Have Your Say. Pleasure. Well, the three of you, let me read you this uh, blog post put up at hedgeanalyst.com, who says, is Syria beyond the point of no return? We believe the escalation in violence over the past two weeks has altered the dynamic materially and a return to the status quo is no longer likely. Mona, do you agree with that analysis? I do, actually. I think that Syria has been at the point of no return for a while now. I think um, the, the horrendous and vicious violence from the Assad security forces to, towards the peaceful protesters has sickened many people. And the fact that we see more and more people join the demonstrations every week, and we hear about the atro atrocious violence against children especially, um, says to me that people are joining, people have hurdled over the barrier of fear, and I don't think Assad has a future in Syria. Paul? I'm not sure that I completely agree that the point of no return has yet been reached. Um, I mean, clearly the demonstrations which have been taking place in the last uh, couple of weeks or so have increased significantly in terms of the, their number and their geographical uh, distribution. But I don't think that the tipping point uh, has yet been reached where it is inevitable that the regime is going to fall. And I think that the problem uh, is, is mainly that the army itself has yet uh, to split in some fundamental way. What we've been seeing have been some, certainly some desertions. But I think until a senior army general uh, takes with him a significant part of the army, it's going to be very difficult for the opposition to overcome the regime. 
And David, just before you come in, as Paul was speaking, we were seeing pictures from today in Abu Kamal in Syria. Also, the Reuters Newswire is saying that security forces shot dead 16 protesters at several demonstrations across Syria, um, demanding the removal of President Assad. Also, we know from state media, uh, they are saying some policemen have been shot at and injured in Damascus. It's very difficult for us to verify either of those two claims. David, let's bring you in here. Do you think Syria is now at the point of no return? Well, I think the status quo ante will be impossible to, re to regain. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure that uh, we can yet talk about a change of regime uh, and the departure of Bashar al-Assad. Uh, I'm st struck by the way in which Assad uh, keeps uh, trying to offer concessions. The latest is uh, the statement that the much disliked uh, cousin of Bashar, Rami Makhlouf, will give up business interests. This is something that people were talking uh, about with me in, in Bashar's circle uh, back in, in February uh, before these protests began. They're just finally getting around to, to, to try to get out. It, it, it shows that they're still struggling to find some modus vivendi going forward. I can't imagine that it won't be something that uh, is in effect a coalition. I wouldn't be surprised to see Turkish uh, Prime Minister Erdogan, who is friendly with Bashar and also has good contacts with some of the rebel groups, try to broker some, some transition arrangement. But returning to what was, I think, is impossible. You mentioned the relationship between Turkey and Syria. It's worth adding that President Assad has sent a senior envoy to Turkey for discussions with Prime Minister Erdogan, trying to improve relations there. Paul, you uh, dealt with Syria as a diplomat and I'm sure dealt with Turkey as well. Do you think their relationship is also becoming irreparably damaged? It's quite clear that the relationship has uh, been damaged quite significantly in the past uh, couple of months or so. What had been uh, quite um, a warming up of that relationship as the Erdogan government reoriented its foreign policy away from Israel um, has of course now been diverted by the violence which has taken place uh, in Syria and, and, and of course uh, even more by the influx of refugees from Syria into Turkey. Um, and the Turks are clearly very, very, very concerned about that. Uh, the Turks also, unlike uh, many countries in the region, actually have a degree of leverage over Syria which they could exercise uh, if they chose to. Uh, and of course th there are stories, um, I think unconfirmed at the moment, that the Turks may be thinking of intervening to create some sort of safe zone for internally displaced people um, within Syria to prevent them from having to go into Turkey. And as we always do on World Have Your Say, as we converse about whatever our subject is, we also play you latest pictures we're getting here at the BBC. Those uh, pictures you were seeing as Paul was talking were from a couple of days ago. They were uploaded uh, to the internet. We believe that uh, they can be verified from a couple of days ago, protesters burning uh, a picture of President Assad. And if you want to see more videos that have been uploaded and looked at by uh, BBC journalists, if you go to bbc.com slash news, uh, you'll be able to see them all attached to a map. Just click on Middle East and you'll be able to find them very easily. Now, let's bring up another message here for our guests. And by the way, if you're thinking, where's Sand Monkey? He's just tweeted that he's outside the BBC office in Cairo and can't get in. We don't know exactly why, but we've sent someone to try and sort that out. And hopefully he'll be joining us very soon. In the meantime, Pancher in Belgium asked this question on World Have Your Say. In spite of its superior military strength, NATO doesn't appear to be able to dislodge Gaddafi. Why is it taking so long? David from the Washington Post, what's your view of that? Well, I, I think first it's been a, a, a limited and somewhat uh, disorganized military campaign. Um, I think NATO's uh, experience shows that uh, a, a leading U.S. role is important in military uh, uh, operations. Um, the, the other members of, of NATO just don't seem to have uh, the, the wherewithal to conduct the kind of aggressive campaign that, that, would, that would intimidate Gaddafi and his military forces and, 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 and make a change. Uh, I, I, I do think that still for the United States and for all of its partners, the goal here is some kind of negotiated political solution. And uh, in the last week, I know there have been conversations at a high level in Washington exploring what might be possible in terms of getting Gaddafi out of Tripoli, out of power. Uh, I, I think the idea of, of continuing an ever uh, escalating military campaign uh, is not what uh, the United States would like to see. I don't think, I don't think any of the NATO partners really envision that. They, they see military pressure leading to a political settlement. 
Mona, what's your view on this for Pantra in Belgium who wants to know why is it proving so hard to get Gaddafi out of power? I think because from the beginning NATO has been confused about what exactly it wanted to do in Libya. And um, I agree about the U.S. role. The first few days we saw the U.S. In a, in a much more obvious role than we've seen it lately. But clearly they pulled back because they recognize how unpopular they are in the region and how unpopular it would be. It, it's quite unpalatable to talk about another U.S. operation of any kind in the Middle East and North Africa right now, considering Iraq and Afghanistan and the U.S. Uh, the U.S. is very unpopular history in the region, especially because it props up so many dictators there. So I think that because they're confused, they don't know what they wanted to do. Was it to protect civilians? Was it to get Gaddafi out? Unless someone steps out and, and very forthrightly says, this is our mission. I mean, Gaddafi so far has been good at hiding whatever bunker he hides in. Mm -hmm. But it will need a massive uh, attack. And, and they're probably also um, worried about civilian casualties because people are, again, sickened by the levels of violence in Libya. I think considering what happened in Egypt and Tunisia, which were relatively non-violent. I mean, more than a thousand people died in Egypt, so it wasn't completely without bloodshed. But Libya and Syria, uh, you know, on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, have been very violent mm -hmm. uh, from the regime side. And so I would imagine that NATO also don't want to create um, thousands of civilian casualties and again, you know, call to mind any kind of so-called Western intervention in the region. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a combination of confusion at no, not wanting to add to the bloodshed. Mona, thanks for your response. Pancha, thanks for the email. So Mona's live with us from L.A. David's in Washington, D.C. Paul is in London. Wherever you're watching BBC World News, we're live. We're always live on World Have Your Say, and you're always welcome to take part. You can phone us up now. It's country code 44 2070 You're welcome to raise any issue or question you like with our guests. We've spoken to three of them. Sand Monkey, probably Egypt's most famous blogger, is imminent. Uh, he's just tweeted he's in the lift, so we're hoping to speak to him uh, quite soon. He's tweeting all the way into the studio. Let's um, shift our attention to Yemen now. We can speak to Ibrahim, who joins us on Skype from Sana. Ibrahim, what would you like to raise? Well, uh, we just heard a few hours uh, news about President Saleh uh, not coming back to Yemen, according to one of the Saudi officials. And uh, there's always this debate about whether he will come back or not. Uh, but here in the ground, I mean, the discussion has already taken another another stream where we are discussing a post-Salah era and what could be done in the coming days in order uh, in order to maintain a, a peaceful transition of power here in Yemen. Well, maybe uh, we're going to take a break in a, in a few moments' time, but maybe after the break we can pick up on that, how Yemeni should approach this very strange situation where their president is out of the country and we don't know if he's coming back. And just in case you're coming to the news and haven't seen what's been happening in and around Yemen, a Saudi official told a number of different news agencies that President Ali Abdullah Saleh will not be returning to Yemen. Then about an hour later, a Yemeni government official in Sana'a said... Yes, he will be coming back. And in the meantime, there's another huge protest in Sana calling for him to step down, whether he returns or not. We'll talk about how Yemenis might approach that uh, very strange situation with our guests from around the world in just a couple of minutes' time. Hi, this is Ross Atkins with you on World Have Your Say. We're live and we've got a panel of experts talking about the situation in the Arab world. Wherever you're watching, if you've got a question or a comment for them, you can either phone up, country code 44 2070 83 72 72, or just email us, worldhaveyoursay at bbc.com. Or if you're tweeting as you listen, I know that Mona is, stick the hashtag WHYS in your tweets and we'll pick all of those up. Now our three guests, just in case you're just joining us, are Mona El Tahawi, an Arab affairs analyst, live with us from LA. We also have Paul Whiteway, former British diplomat in Syria, and David Ignatius of the Washington Post. Now, just before the break, we heard from Ibrahim in Yemen, who was basically asking all three of you, how should we approach this when our president is out of the country and we don't know how or when he's going to come back? Paul, what would you say? I think this is um, a hugely difficult problem for the Yemeni people. Um, to begin with, the uh, revolution that broke out in, in Yemen was stirred by social and economic uh, injustice uh, and led to uh, demands for the president uh, to, to step down. Um, but since then, um, it's, it's rather, the, rather been hijacked, I think, by uh, other, other powers within Yemen. Uh, there has, it's turned into a power struggle between you know, two particular family groups 
and to some degree I think the Yemeni people have been sidelined. At the same time, what has also happened is that the international diplomacy surrounding Yemen has not uh, turned out to be uh, in any way helpful. The Security Council had a meeting to discuss uh, Yemen uh, back in April. It was a private session. It mm -hmm. failed to even to adopt a statement uh, reaching any conclusions about, about Yemen, uh, let alone any sort of resolution that would have provided uh, for progress towards uh, a, some sort of solution. Indeed, I think I'm right in saying that the Security Council hasn't adopted a resolution on Yemen since the 1994 civil war. Mm -hmm. So I'm afraid I'm, I'm rather at a loss to know what to, to suggest to the Yemeni people just now. David, why don't you come in here and Mona, by all means, pick up afterwards. Well, I think Paul uh, made some good points. From the United States standpoint, uh, the Obama administration sees an o overriding national security priority for the United States in containing al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which has taken uh, refuge in, in Yemen. Uh, so the top priority for the U.S. Uh, is making sure that whatever government uh, uh, arises uh, in this presumably post-Sala area era, it will be one that takes the counterterrorism mission seriously. The U.S. is also, according to the stories in the Washington mm -hmm. Post and other other newspapers, uh, made plans to to, to operate its uh, dr predator drones in Yemen against the, this al-Qaeda adversary, regardless of who's in charge. So this is an area where uh, rail politique is the, is the rule for the U.S. Um, my own sense is that unless uh, our policy is accompanied by some effort to reach out uh, to the civil society in Yemen and, and, and begin a process of transition so that you'll have some kind of stable successor government, mm -hmm. uh, all of our counterterrorism uh, efforts may, may go for naught if the place is a complete may, uh, So that's interesting. I mean, both of you have focused in on America's relationship with Yemen. Ibrahim, you're with us live from Sana'a. Do you see that relationship as being crucial to the future of your country? Yeah, it, it's crucial, but uh, I think one of the problems that we are facing in this problem is that uh, the approach that the international society is, is, is taking uh, the issue of Yemen is through the security lens only. Uh, there's no concentration on other, uh, other areas as well. And I think in this crucial moment in Yemen where we are facing a lot of challenges, mm -hmm. to come up with, with a right solution, we need to think outside the FUAB box. We need to think in, uh, on the wider uh, economic, social, and, and political context. Yeah, the, there is some uh, uh, power struggle in Yemen now, but until the moment, the revolution is still ongoing. But, Young but, people but, are determined to stay and to keep the peaceful revolution. But Ibrahim, let me come in here. You say the revolution is still go ongoing. Mona, um, I sit in this chair at this time, uh, at the same time every week, and every week for as long as I can remember, I've told our viewers that there have been huge protests in Sana'a. It just happens like clockwork every week. Some are beginning to argue that that tactic alone isn't delivering results. You know, the Yemeni people have been incredibly tenacious and patient. They have been rising up since February the 10th. So yes, I can imagine that you imagine that it's been going on forever. But I think that speaks to how it is the Yemeni people who have brought the country to the point where the leader basically had to flee for medical care or for whatever reason and is hopefully not coming back. Um, it, this revolution had nothing to do with Al-Qaeda in Yemen. Al-Qaeda might have a presence, no matter how large or small. But I agree with Ibrahim. This has to do with the people of Yemen. They are the ones who've been rising up. And whoever wants to be in power in Yemen, who wants to, whoever wants to talk about power sharing agreements in Yemen, must remember that it's the Yemeni people who are there filling the squares every week. And it's the Yemeni people now who must insist on having their voices included, just as it was the uh, Egyptian people and the Tunisian people, because this has nothing to do with the United States. I mean, mm -hmm. once again, what's happening in Yemen has left the United States far behind, struggling to catch up with what the people on the ground actually want, regardless of what the regime there says they want, because the regime in Yemen for so long has monopolized on this security fear that the United States has obsessively focused on. So this is about the Yemeni people. What do the Yemeni people want? They are the ones who have been rising up since February the 10th. They are the ones who should have a say in what government they have beyond this fight between two families and they're the ones remember who have been peaceful that beyond the tribes that have been fighting with mm -hmm. Saleh the Yemeni people have not fight for, uh, 
shot one bullet during the revolution is, there is, that began on February the 10th. But let's be honest, there's a, now a debate online about whether that peaceful approach alone will deliver results or whether they should continue, consider uh, using force. Wherever you're watching, especially if you're in uh, Yemen, but wherever you're watching, if you've got an interest in those protests, do you think uh, their tactics, the protesters' tactics, are working even though they haven't delivered full results yet? You're welcome to call us up. Country code 442070837272 or tweet us using the hashtag WHYS. Well, uh, Mona is a prolific tweeter and so is Sand Monkey, probably Egypt's best known blogger. And the good news is he's not in the lift, he's in the BBC studio. I'm glad you made it, Sand Monkey. Hello, how are you doing? Thank you very much for joining us. Let me pull up a message, a quick message here from Chris um, in the UK who says, Why has the Arab League gone oh so quiet? Do you think the Arab League has had enough to say about what's happening in Syria, what's happening in Lebanon and Yemen? Uh, why is anybody ever talking about the Arab League? I don't understand this. They're like a board of dictators, basically. They're basically a bunch of people who are not elected, who are not chosen, <clears throat> and somehow the international community chooses to give them some legitimacy over affairs you know, concerning people who are trying to overthrow them. Of course, they're not going to have any statement regarding Yemen. They're not going to have any strong position regarding Syria, any real position regarding Syria. And let's face it, they are a tea club. All right, Basically, so you, you're saying no just, power, just leave them out of it. Nothing. David, do you think that's appropriate now? Well, I think they, they have limited influence, and I think Sand Monkey's characterization of them is, 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 is right on, that this is, this is the club of those in power. Uh, it's, it is the case that when the Arab League endorsed the idea of military intervention to support the rebels in Libya, this was taken as a key uh, event in Washington and is what I think led to the U.S. supporting the NATO intervention. So uh, however unrepresentative, the U.S. St still takes the Arab League uh, somewhat, somewhat seriously. Just to go back to the basic point that Ibrahim made in, 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 in Sana. It is absolutely the, 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 the issue. Can the Yemeni people find a way of getting transition, working with elements of their army, as happened in the case of the Tahrir Square protesters in the Egyptian military, mm -hmm. or in some other way? But that's the issue. I think he's got it focused right on it. Mona? Um, about the Arab League, I think they are, are utterly irrelevant because they are clearly the regime side. I mean, it's to ask the Arab League to take a position on a country that is facing a popular uprising would be like to ask Mubarak, how does he feel about the Egyptian revolution as it was happening? So I, 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 I totally agree with Sand Monkey. It's, it's completely irrelevant. I don't think anybody should be focusing on the Arab League. I think we should have some kind of shadow league of Arab revolutionaries or revolutionaries from the Middle East and North Africa. Mm -hmm so that they can at least represent the voice of the people and not the voice of these dictators scared they're going to be toppled any minute now. All right, Mona and uh, Sand Monkey, I'll give you 30 seconds to uh, do your next tweet because Arno is joining us live over the internet from Paris. Arno, which element of the, the situation in the Arab world would you like to comment on? Yeah, I would like to comment on the situation in Syria because it's, uh, to me it sounds, uh, it sounds very interesting, the, the last rumors um, about the potential uh, Escape from Saad, uh, former Prime Minister Saad Ari to, to Paris. I would like to, to hear your views about it. But what particular element of what's happening in Syria would you like to put to our panel? Yeah, because uh, a lot of um, a lot of uh, articles in the Lebanese media were saying that Saad Ari would be uh, might be in France right now because the uh, Syrian government would be uh, could could be planning to kill him to uh, to make a new civil war between Shiites and the Sunnis in, uh, in Syria. Okay, so in, Arno, uh, let, me, uh, let me promise you to put that point to our panel, not now, in a couple of minutes' time, because we're going to take a break here on World Have Your Say. Thank you very much for joining us from Paris. When we come back, we'll continue talking uh, with Paul in London, David in Washington, D.C., Mona in L.A., and Sand Monkey in Cairo. Keep on tweeting the hashtags WHYS. <laughs> I'm Ros Atkins. Welcome to World Have Your Say. If you're new to the show, we're a news discussion program. We're always live and you're always welcome to take part. And this week, the Arab uprisings have continued to provide the biggest talking points in the world. So rather than focus on one issue or one country, we've invited a group of experts onto the show to respond to as many of the issues that you're raising as possible. They're live from London, Cairo, Washington, D.C. and L.A. 
You can still post messages for them at worldhaveyoursay.com. And if you're tweeting, as several of them are, use the hashtag WHYS. And if you want to call us up, we're live, so you can speak directly to our panel, who I'll introduce you to in just a moment. The number to call is country code 44 72 I can see that Pascal uh, Jacob Mwanza has just tweeted using the hashtag WHYS to say, the UN's lack of proactive response in Syria is amazing. Why has it been more proactive in other countries? Well, Pascal, I'll pick up on that issue uh, in a couple of minutes' time. But first of all, we should catch up on all of the day's main news. We're going to begin with the French and German leaders, uh, Angela Merkel, Nicolas Sarkozy. They've called for a quick solution to the Greek debt crisis. This comes as the Greek Prime Minister, George Papandreou, has reshuffled his cabinet. That's all in the hope of winning parliamentary approval for further austerity measures. As we've been talking about, there are renewed protests across Syria against President Assad. This demonstration in the eastern town of Abu Kamal is among those that are taking place following Friday prayers. A number of policemen are reported to have been shot and wounded in Damascus. And we have unconformed reports that at least eight demonstrators have been shot dead. Seoul has rejected North Korea's demand to return nine people who defected by boat into the south on Saturday. North Korea has warned that relations could worsen if they're not returned. To China next, where days of torrential rain have forced the evacuation of hundreds of thousands of people in the centre and the south of the country. The areas affected had previously been drought-stricken, and the government says the floods are the worst since 1955. And NATO warplanes have carried out fresh daytime attacks on targets in the Libyan capital, Tripoli. Loud blasts were heard across the city shortly after the NATO planes flew over. Libya complained that an earlier overnight raid hit a public security building, killing a number of people and destroying criminal records. OK, well, let's begin our conversation with David Ignatius, associate editor of The Washington Post, live with us from Washington, D.C., and Mona El Tahawi, a prolific tweeter and also an Arab affairs analyst. And the two of you, um, just before the news, we, uh, we had that point from Arno in Paris talking about how uh, the situation in Syria is being managed by the outside world. Pascal um, in Zambia making a very similar comment on Twitter. It's a recurring theme, but it doesn't mean it's not important. David, what's your view of this? Is the international community beginning to get it right? Well, uh, the, uh, the international community is, is looking for a way to, to, to intervene uh, effectively. There, there's some blockage. Russia, traditionally an ally of Syria, uh, appears to be, to be poised to, to, to veto a Security Council resolution it doesn't like. One paradox of the situation is that as President Assad's position weakens at home in Syria, it, it grows somewhat stronger with the formation of an essentially pro-Syrian government in Lebanon. Uh, I think Arnaud was referring to the possibility that Saad Hariri, the leader of the March 14 uh, opposition movement, may leave Lebanon, uh, go to France, go somewhere. Um, and, and that would reflect, I think, uh, concern that, that March 14 is being squeezed out. Um, I think the issue for me as I think about Syria is what is the transition that can provide more democratic government in Syria and avoid a, a bloodbath between the ethnic groups there that have a history of violence. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there is a history of Sunni Alawite tension and violence in the cities of the north. We've seen some of that. And I think that people who want a, a, a good future, a happy future for Syria, need to think, what's the transition that, that avoids that bloodshed rather mm -hmm. than making it worse? All right, so that's your view from Washington, D.C. Let's get a couple of quick comments from Cairo and L.A. before bringing up some more of the messages coming in. Um, uh, the blogger Sand Monkey, Mahmoud, is with us from Cairo. What's your view of how the international community is handling the situation in Syria? I think for the most part, the international community is complicit in the situation in Syria. I think Bashar al-Assad is practically like one president that 
very different forces don't want to see him removed. I don't think Syria wants Bashar removed, Iran doesn't want Bashar removed, and Saudi doesn't want Bashar removed. So it's one of those uh, situations, I mean, uh, Saudi, Iran, and uh, Israel. So it's the first time those three nations actually agree on something. And they kind of, in a way, influence foreign policy in very different quarters. Israel and Saudi influence America and the Western states. And Iran has influence over, you know, Russia in that sense. Nobody wants that man removed. You know, now they're using all kinds of arguments regarding that there will be sectarian strife and there will be problems. And, well, you know something? There's already sectarian strife. You have the people from one sect, the Alawites, killing everybody else, you know, who is stopping their rule. And they're a minority. Mm -hmm. So just because they appear to be secular... You know, doesn't doesn't negate the fact that they're butchers and that they're killing everybody in okay. Syria. Okay, let's, uh, you know? let's, so let's, let's bring. So for me, the whole idea that somehow the transition would save lives—no, lives are being killed. People are dying already. The, you know, it's time for him to go. Let's bring it's in. Mo let's bring in Mo Mo Let me interrupt you. Let's bring themselves. in Mona here, and if all of you um, are able to keep your answers relatively brief, we'll get through as many of the points as we can. Mona, pick up on this Hello? issue, please. I think it's absolutely astounding what's been happening in Syria because if you remember back to when Tunisia started its revolution, everybody kept saying it will never happen here and the number one country where everyone said this would never happen was Syria. So the fact that thousands upon thousands of Syrians continue to rise up against Bashar al-Assad says to me that people are voting by their feet and mm -hmm. saying we don't want this man. As far as it comes to, um, uh, when it comes to um, alternatives to Bashar al-Assad, there are many capable Syrians who can take over. I've been to Damascus many times and as hard as the Assad regime, both Hafiz the father and Bashar now the son and the cronies around them have tried to marginalize leaders, they continue. Syria is full of incredibly educated, politically aware people. There was a, a, a meeting, a conference of Syrian opposition in Turkey a few weeks ago last month. There are many Syrians who have seriously been discussing ways to bring together the various ethnic and sectarian groups in their country peacefully. And the one obstacle towards bringing all those people together is clearly the Assad Assad regime. So I think that, that it, that's not impossible. Every country in the region has come up with excuses mm -hmm. as to why the revolution is something to be feared. But the people inside those countries are saying, we want this revolution, so let's listen to those people. Thanks for those comments, Mona. We've had calls so far from Pakistan, New Zealand, Nigeria, Iraq, Australia, Cameroon, Angola, Austria, India, Egypt, Serbia, Kazakhstan and Martinique. We'll try and get uh, some of you onto the air between now and the end of the show. If we don't manage it, we'll also put some of your comments up on the screen as we talk. And there's World Have Your Say Extra 1830 GMT where we can squeeze in uh, some more of your comments. I can see that Ben in Brisbane has got in touch to say there's a double standard in the Middle East. People are dying in Syria and the West is doing nothing, he says. And Ishmael's called from Mauritius to say Assad's got to stay because he's a counterbalance to Israel's power. Let's pull up um, a, a comment from a Princeton University academic called Bernard Haeckel. He's been writing in the Foreign Affairs magazine, Saudi Arabia, perpetually in fear of chaos and instability, is a leading force in the counter-revolution against the Arab Spring. And we know about this quote because it was retweeted again and again and again uh, in the last day or so. And I'm curious to know whether our panel agrees with its analysis. Paul Whiteway is a former British diplomat who was based in Syria. Paul, do you agree with that analysis? I think it's a very plausible statement, yes. I mean, clearly the Saudi regime is a, an extremely conservative one. Uh, the royal family would be very deeply concerned were there to be any, any sort of successful revolution um, in, in, in the region. And uh, the fact that they were quick to send uh, troops to intervene in Bahrain um, suggests uh, that um, they are, they'll do what, what they can to try and prevent it. David? Yes, I, I think without question Saudi Arabia has, has stated openly that it, 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 it wants uh, to, to slow the pace of change. The Saudis are furious at the United States for supporting the ouster, the re removal of President Mubarak in Egypt. They're still angry about that. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a situation where, where Saudi Arabia is, is the status quo power in the region, really more, I think, now than the United States. Mona, Paul, feel free to come in. Oh, Saudi Arabia is undoubtedly the darkest counter-revolutionary force in the region. And if there's one place that I wish we could have a revolution in right now, both for political and religious reasons, it would be Saudi Arabia. And we're actually starting to see the Saudi revolution led by women. Because today, June 17, Women to Drive Day, I Shall Drive Myself Day, I, that's what I've been tweeting all day. Women who've gone out and defied the ban on driving and basically said, in, you know, a woman, a, a month and a half ago, a woman called Manana Sharif, 
very eloquently said the rain begins with one drop and she was that one drop she was arrested for driving and uploading her video onto YouTube and has encouraged Saudi women ever since to go out and drive their cars and today we're hearing reports of Saudi women with their husbands sometimes sitting next to them or their husbands themselves filming them and this is how the revolution will begin in Saudi Arabia thanks to Saudi women and so I the, the day I am dying for the day when Saudi Arabia has a revolution that gives um, equal rights to all its groups Sunni and Shia women and men because that will be a huge load taken off the road of revolution and freedom and dignity but for the entire Mona, world Mona, not just the Middle East and you're North saying this is how the revolution will begin the first drop leads to, to rain and so on but Paul that's clearly what Mona would like to see happen but being realistic it's not going to in Saudi Arabia is it well, I think that the, the government clearly um, has, uh, enjoys many strengths. It has very, very considerable resources thanks to its oil wealth. Um, it enjoys the strong support of the West uh, because it's a major oil exporter and because of the strategic position which it, it occupies. So I don't think it, it's going to be at all easy mm -hmm. uh, for the, the Arab Spring to, to, to bear uh, fruit uh, in, in any sort of early shape or form in Saudi Arabia. Thanks to all of you for your responses to that. Let me um, quickly bring in uh, another guest. The Daya Ahmed is on the phone from Bahrain. She's a writer and TV host. Um, which uh, part of the Arab Spring would you like to talk about? I'm pretty sure you must want to talk about the situation in your home country. I'd like to speak about what happened here. And I want to make something clear. What happened in Bahrain wasn't similar to what happened in Egypt and in Tunisia. What happened in Egypt was a revolution. What happened in Tunisia was a revolution. What happened in Bahrain was an attempt to topple the regime. And there are many facts that prove what I'm saying now. What happened in Bahrain is a few uh, political societies who gathered and decided to topple the regime and were working for uh, the formation of an Islamic Republic. And this was announced by the leader of the opposition at the roundabout. He actually announced the formation of a democratic Islamic Republic and he announced that the name of this republic, Democratic Republic, will soon be announced by three political parties. The first step uh, that reflects that what the agenda was, wasn't a democracy. Now, if this was a revolution, the protesters wouldn't have been violent, wouldn't have killed police, wouldn't but, have killed... But, uh, Adia, you, you're, you're, saying, you're telling us about these declarations. In the meantime, the government's beginning a, a national dialogue, as it calls it, on the 1st of July. We've got to take a break in a, in a moment, but I'm curious to talk with you and all of the others about whether dialogue between protesters and governments is possible after all the bitterness that protests and, and repression can create. We'll get onto that in just a moment. Keep on tweeting if you're watching and got your computer or your phone uh, to hand as you watch. The hashtag's WHYS or go to facebook.com slash world have your say. We'll be back with our guests in the United States, in Cairo and in Bahrain in just a couple of minutes. Hi, Ron thanks for joining me here on World Have Your Say. A couple of things to mention. Just before the break, Mona was talking about some women protesting against the ban against them driving by going out in their cars today. We'll be talking about that at 17 hours GMT, just over an hour's time on the BBC World Service. That's the radio service. You can listen at bbcworldservice.com. Uh, also, an apology to Mahmoud Sandmonkey, the blogger from Cairo. His line has fallen down. We are struggling to get that back up, and I suspect we won't manage it before the end of the programme. So thanks to him for his contribution and apologies we haven't heard more from him. Now, um, just before the news, uh, we spoke to Adia in Bahrain who was talking about uh, declarations of an alternative government from some uh, protesters. I was mentioning uh, that the government wants to create a national dialogue. Paul, you're a, a diplomat by trade. Do you think it's actually realistic to bring both parties together after all the bitterness that comes with, with protests and repression? I think in a general sense, uh, dialogue, of course, has to come at some stage uh, in, in these, these sort of events. Um, but it, it depends um, partly on the opposition movement being able to be sufficiently coherent for a leadership to mm. emerge that can participate um, in a credible way in, in negotiations. And it also depends on the government itself uh, accepting that negotiation is the right exit as opposed to some sort of um, face-saving um, method or some sort of way of distracting attention without the government uh, actually uh, giving up the option of repression. Um, and what happens in these instances is that there comes a stage when uh, this, sort of, uh, this sort of crossover of these two ideas 
um, can happen. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure whether that point has been reached in, in the case of, of Bahrain. Uh, it certainly hasn't been reached anything like in the case of Syria, where clearly the regime uh, is still putting its faith uh, in, in repression, and where mm -hmm. the opposition, um, who are, of course are, are enormously brave, um, have not yet managed to produce uh, a sort of coherent leadership which, which could conduct uh, such negotiation. Well, Paul, you're talking about Syria. I know we've got a call coming through from Damascus, which we'll try and get the line up in the next 30 seconds or so. In the meantime, let's bring in Mega uh, from the World Have Your Say team, where uh, in the news desk, where they've been taking all of your calls. Hi, Mega. Hi. So we've been taking calls from Zimbabwe, Japan, Syria, Australia, Nigeria. And here's a flavour of what people have been saying. Raleb called us from Dubai. The international community shouldn't interfere with the Arab Spring. Abdullah tweeted, what happens once and if Gaddafi leaves power, who will take over? Want to join us? Have a look at the hashtag on the screen, WHYS. Thanks very much indeed. Mega Okan in Australia has just texted to say every time NATO goes anywhere, it seems to make the situation worse. Let's bring in Malik, who's phoned us from Damascus. Malik, thanks for watching and thanks for calling. What can you tell us about what's happening where you live in Damascus? Okay, I can say that the demonstrations now are widely spread all over Syria. I mean, contrary to what the regime is saying, that there are a few demonstrators in Syria there or scattered demonstrations. Now we, we, we can say that demonstrations are all over in Dara, in Damascus, in all the middle, from the middle to the uh, extreme north of uh, uh, to the extreme north of uh, Syria. There are, all, there are demonstrations all over these places. Some of them are hundreds of thousands, like mm. in summer, hundreds of thousands uh, last week demonstrated, and in, in there, are, there are large numbers as well. So you're saying um, you're hearing that there, there are, are protests in different everywhere. parts of Syria. It's very difficult for us to, just to explain to those of you watching, it's very difficult for us to verify uh, very much of what's happening in Syria, but we do believe there have been uh, protests in various cities. As uh, Malik says, uh, activists are saying at least eight people have been killed. The uh, authorities are saying the police have come under fire in Damascus, of course, as we are able to uh, verify these stories. We'll tell you about it here on BBC World News. Now, a very quick message for uh, our panel just before we finish. Matthew Weaver is a uh, reporter in London for the Guardian newspaper, and he um, tweeted, are journalists failing to properly report the Arab Spring, and should we all start learning Arabic? Um, Mona and David, just quickly from you. Mona, do you think we all need to speak Arabic if we have to fully understand what's happening in the region? I think it's more than just speaking Arabic. Speaking Arabic would be great. I think how about renewing your list of contacts? Because for the longest time, the media outside of the region has relied on a very old list of experts and analysts who have always said this would never happen. And then it happened. The revolutions began. And they continue to go back to the same analysts and experts who said it would never happen to explain why it happened. I think it's ridiculous. So I think that the international media needs to create new contacts. It needs to talk to new people. Mm -hmm. It needs to talk to younger people. And it needs to talk to people who actually believe in the Middle East and North Africa and the ability of people on the ground to bring about change because I think that's just as important as speaking the language of the region. Mona, thank you very much. David, I'm completely out of time to come to you even for the briefest of comments. I apologise and I'm absolutely certain we'll be inviting you back onto World Have Your Say and uh, I'll give you some more time then. Sorry about that. So thanks very much to Sand Monkey who joined us from Cairo to Paul Whiteway in London to David Ignatius in Washington DC and Mona El Tahawi in LA. And of course, most of all, thank you very much to all of you who've been posting your comments and questions. In one hour's time, we'll be on BBC World Service Radio to carry on the conversation. I'll be back here with World Have Your Say Extra at 18.30 GMT. But I'll speak to you then, I'll speak to you next week. Goodbye. <laughs>